Coming up on Arirang News, the South Korean financial authorities pledge to take swift action to stabilize local markets if there's a surge in volatility because of the U.S.-China trade war. A new projection from the World Trade Organization suggests that South Korea will see its working population drop faster than any other country in the world over the next two decades. And U.S. President Donald Trump warns North Korea's Kim Jong-un that he stands to lose everything if he goes back to his provocations, but also saying he thinks Kim is too smart to act rashly. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. Both North Korea and the U.S. are trying to raise the pressure on each other as their nuclear talks falter. President Trump has warned the North Korean leader not to go back to a hostile policy or risk voiding their special relationship. This comes after the North announced an important test at its satellite launching site over the weekend. Lee Sung Jae has this report. With Washington and Pyongyang exchanging heated rhetoric over the past week or so, U.S. President Donald Trump took to Twitter on Sunday, telling the regime's leader Kim Jong-un in no uncertain terms that he could lose everything if he continues to be hostile toward the United States. However, Trump also reiterated his commitment to continue diplomacy with the North Korean leader, saying Kim Jong-un is too smart to be rash with hostile acts. President Trump added Kim does not want to void his special relationship with him, nor does he want to interfere with the U.S. presidential election in late 2020. He went on to reiterate the tremendous economic potential North Korea has, but stressed the importance of denuclearizing the regime, just as Kim has promised. However, observers say Kim may be pushing Trump's limit, seen by its recent messages by the U.S. president. While Trump has continued to tout the strong personal relationship he has with Kim, some say his threat of military force if necessary, and his latest tweets saying Kim could lose everything shows Trump may be increasingly irritated by the North. In an interview with Fox News, which was aired on Sunday local time, U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper says the U.S. military is in a high state of readiness amid North Korea's recent missile tests, but again stressed the importance of diplomacy, saying talks are always open. Uh, my job is to main sure, main main ensure that we are ready, prepared to fight and win tonight if necessary. I believe we're in a high state of readiness right now. But my second task is to enable our diplomats. And I, I think the talks are always open. Uh, I've said, Secretary Pompeo has said, and certainly President Trump has said, we want to sit down, we want to have negotiations, we want to reach the point where we have denuclearized North Korea. However, Esper's comments come as North Korea announced on Sunday that it has conducted a very important test the previous day at a long-range missile site, which was partially dismantled last year. How this news will fare with Trump and his administration may indicate the future relations between the two sides and the regime's path to denuclearization. Lee seung Arirang News. U.S. media have been widely reporting on North Korea's announcement yesterday at a, of a test at its Sohe satellite launching site. They agree that it was likely a missile engine and that it's a sign of the regime trying to raise the pressure. Kim Yo sun takes a closer look. Major U.S. media outlets are paying close attention to the developments made in North Korea after the regime announced on Sunday that it had conducted a, quote, very important test at its missile engine and satellite launch site. Citing experts, the New York Times reported Sunday that Pyongyang had most likely tested a new type of engine for long-range ballistic missiles. It added such an announcement is another sign of the regime escalating pressure on Washington to make further concessions before the end of December, a deadline for nuclear talks that has been set by its leader Kim Jong-un. The Washington Post stated that such a move is a threat to give the U.S. an unwelcome Christmas gift. It also pointed out that such tests paved the way for the regime to launch a satellite or an intercontinental ballistic missile around the end of the year. Earlier this month, the North's Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs Lee Tae-sung said it was up to Washington what Christmas gift it gets from the regime. The Washington Post also explained that the latest announcement is just another sign of the deteriorating relations between the North and U.S. after their second summit in Hanoi ended with no agreement in February. The article cited Jeffrey Lewis, director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, as saying what the regime tested over the weekend could have been an improved Hwasong-15 
or a solid propellant ICBM. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. North Korea, facing tough international sanctions, is looking to boost its tourism sector to attract foreign visitors and earn currency. It says it's now finished building a hot springs spa resort at Yangdok, which is one of the key tourist sites that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has paid special attention to. According to Pyongyang's Korean Central News Agency, a ceremony was held on Saturday to celebrate the resort's completion. Kim has visited the hot springs four times this year, and he attended the opening as well, where the report says he showed great satisfaction. On Sunday, the vice chairman of the North's ruling party central committee looked around Yangduk County, which is home to the hot springs and has also been redeveloped as a whole. President Moon Jae-in sat down today with Bono, the lead singer of the band U2, in, a, in town for a concert. President Moon told Bono that the Korean people want peace more than ever before, and Bono praised Moon's efforts to that end, comparing the situation on the peninsula to that of his home country of Ireland. Shin Se-min has the details. President Moon Jae-in, sitting across the lead vocalist of the legendary rock band U2, praised its long-running activism for global peace, including that of the Korean peninsula. Speaking during a meeting Monday with Bono at the top office, the president said the Korean people's desire for peace on the peninsula have grown stronger. Such remarks on unification comes amid the stalled denuclearization talks and rising tensions between North Korea and the U.S. ahead of a December 31st deadline set by Pyongyang for progress in negotiations. The president regarding the Irish rock band's first ever concert held the day before with the first lady in attendance expressed his appreciation for U2's message of peace during the performance. Among the playlist of the band during the concert, the song One was inspired by the fall of the Berlin Wall that brought about the unification of a once divided Germany. I want to thank you also for your leadership in the peace process and your dogged determination um, to go the distance in, in making that peace uh, a reality, not just a day, a dream. And I'm here to encourage that, coming from a small island where we had similar difficulties. He also expressed his respect for President Boon, referring to his initiative to establish peace on the Korean Peninsula and promote an inclusive and transparent development path. Known as a philanthropist, lead vocalist Bono has been using his fame and wealth to fight hunger and promote human rights, anti-war and environmental issues around the world. He had also been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize multiple times for efforts to fight debt in the developing world. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. National Assembly Speaker Moon Hee Sung, together with the floor leaders of Parliament's three largest parties, have agreed to postpone the plenary session set for today and reschedule it for tomorrow to vote on next year's budget proposal. Initially, rival party lawmakers, excluding the main opposition Liberty Korea Party, had agreed to vote today on the budget, along with a set of fast-tracked bills. But the LKP, which opposed the fast-tracked bills, came back to the negotiating table and the three major parties agreed to put off the controversial bills first and vote on the budget bill tomorrow at 10 a.m. on the condition that the LKP withdraws its filibuster request. The LKP is set to make a final announcement about the filibuster's withdrawal in the coming hour. Tottenham Hotspur's South Korean superstar Son Hung Min has made the Team of the Week, chosen by the BBC for his amazing goal against Burnley over the weekend. Tottenham fans also voted him as Man of the Match. Kan Hyung-woo reports. On Saturday against Burnley, Tottenham Hotspur's South Korean winger Son Hung Min picked the ball up on the edge of his own size penalty area in the 31st minute. 12 seconds and 12 touches later, he slammed the ball into the back of the net to put his team 3-0 up after dribbling a remarkable 70 meters, all while shredding almost the entirety of Burnley's defense. Tottenham went on to win the match 5-0, but 
it was Son's wonder goal which drove fans and football experts into a frenzy. BBC football analyst Garth Crooks pinned the South Korean winger on his team of the week as one of the four best midfielders in the 16th round of the EPL. Adding that Son's goal must be an early candidate for goal of the season, Crooks said the last time he saw a goal of such quality was George Weah's wonder goal for AC Milan in 1996. Sports fans also voted Son man of the match for his extraordinary goal and all-around performance. Some 33,000 people participated in a survey on Tottenham Hotspur's official Twitter account, with an overwhelming 71% of them picking the South Korean. It's been a season to remember for Son, who recently broke a new record for the most goals scored by a South Korean in European football, passing legendary player Cha bam previous record of 121. He also won the AFC Asian International Player of the Year award last week. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. South Korea's senior economic policymakers Monday reviewed domestic and external risks to the local financial markets. The first vice finance minister emphasized that the government will take measures to help stabilize markets if necessary. Kim Hesung reports. South Korea's first vice finance minister says the government will take swift measures to stabilize the nation's financial markets in case of increased volatility amid the ongoing U.S.-China trade negotiations. Meeting with senior economic and financial officials on Monday, Kim yong bum said there is a possibility of rising financial volatility if Washington imposes new tariffs on 156 billion U.S. dollars of Chinese goods on December 15th as scheduled. He added that the ongoing Hong Kong protests and President Trump's announcement of metal tariffs aimed at Argentina and Brazil also add to the external risks. In December, foreign investors extended their selling binge of Korean stocks on concerns over the ongoing U.S.-China trade dispute and Korean companies' sluggish earnings. The Korean won also weakened against the greenback. First Vice Finance Minister Kim said the government will closely monitor markets and respond with a contingency plan if there's a sharp fluctuation in the foreign exchange market and stock markets. On a positive note, he added that Korea's current account has continued to record a surplus hitting around 50 billion U.S. dollars between January and October, and that Korea's foreign currency reserves are at a record high. Lastly, he vowed to help boost the real economy through structural reform, including the labor market and the public sector. Kim hye Arirang News. Foreign direct investment into South Korea has surpassed 20 billion U.S. dollars for five years in a row. According to the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy on Monday, this year's FDI amounted to roughly $20.3 billion. The first time it exceeded the $20 billion mark was in 2015, and the figure recorded an all-time high of $26.9 billion last year. The trade ministry said foreign investors have a favorable view of the South Korean market, despite weak investment sentiment globally. It added that investment this year focused pr uh, particularly on high-end consumer goods, including beauty products and equipment. Time now for an in-depth look at the market news as we start the week. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Dr. Yang jun Suk, Professor of Economics at the Catholic University of Korea. Dr. Yang, thank you for coming on today. Happy to be here. Well, the financial markets have been going up and down for months now on the U.S.-China trade war. Data showing China's exports are down sharply. And now we have the deadline coming up on the 15th when new tariffs will take effect. What do you see happening in global stocks in the week to come? Okay, well, global stocks, after falling on last Tuesday, based on some of the reports that you just mentioned in the previous story, like the uh, President Trump's remark that the U.S.-China trade war may be extended, uh, it fell until last uh, Tuesday, then Wednesday it rose, based on, I think, two things. The first is one story in Bloomberg saying that U.S.-China trade deal is close. Now, a lot of stories have referred back to that story, but there has not been any additional stories which confer confirms that from independent sources. And then on Friday, U.S. had a very good jobs report. It was much better than expected, 266,000 jobs created. So uh, the uh, U.S. markets have been rallying, but 
I think they tend to overestimate the value of good news that's coming from the U.S.-China trade talks. So as we get closer to to, uh, December 15th deadline, I think we'll see a lot more fluctuation. And my personal feeling is a bit pessimistic. I do not think the deal will pass. So I think there's more, it's more likely than not that President Trump will put the tariffs on, in which case we'll have at least for a few days a very negative stock market followed by a very volatile time and then maybe a recovery. Uh, but then there's a chance that even if there's no trade deal, President Trump will not put the tariffs on the uh, remaining Chinese goods because, well, uh, if – President Trump puts the uh, tariffs on the remaining goods. Uh, the remaining goods are mostly cons- uh, consumer goods, so it'll have a very direct price increase effect on U.S. consumers. R- uh, right now, President Trump is telling the U.S. consumers that most of the tariffs have been paid by the Chinese companies or Chinese government, uh, and he's been able to get away with that because uh, most of the uh, goods that are, have ch- uh, Chinese tariffs are intermediate goods. But once he puts tariffs on consumption goods, I think the consumers will uh, be able to tell that the uh, burden from the trade will uh, trade tariffs goes on cons- U.S. consumers, and that will have an adverse effect next year when President Trump is running for re-election. So even if the deal is not reached, I think there's a fairly good chance that President Trump will not put the tariffs on. Got it. Well, according to the Korea Development Institute, uh, the Korean economy has been stagnating now for nine months in a row. They say things are unlikely to get worse, but if they don't get better, then there's concern over a possible recession. What kind of recovery do you think we can expect, and what are the variables here? Okay, well, the KDI report basically said that we had, basically, uh, we had a very weak demand, both domestic and exports. Manufacturing production fell. Uh, service production rose, but it rose only weekly. Global circumstances are still very pessimistic, and exports are not likely to rise in the near future. Now, uh, the some optimism in the KDI report is based, I think, on two things. One is that the uh, consumer and business sentiment are looking for uh, are pretty optimistic. Uh, it's after falling for a while, it's starting to rise up, especially the uh, indices, which looks at the future uh, uh, sentiments. Uh, and then uh, the semiconductor uh, prices may go up next year. We're not quite sure about that yet, but a lot of people are betting that semiconductor prices will go up next year, and that will lead to a recovery in Korean exports. Um, Right now, I tend to be a bit pessimistic about that as well. I do agree with KDI that we may have hit bottom, but I don't really see that many factors which lead to indications that uh, uh, there's a rise coming. So uh, the uh, business investment has not really risen, and uh, unless there's a global recovery, I don't think the uh, semiconductor prices will rise. So I don't really see a trigger for a recovery. So even though we may hit bottom, we may skirt along the bottom for a while. Right. Well, looking ahead this week, uh, the Fed will have its final rate-setting meeting of the year. And for Korea, we have the Green Book Report coming out. Tell us about those and what else we might look out for this week. Okay. Well, the biggest item of interest, as we just mentioned before, is the uh, U.S.-China Uh, tariffs, whether President Trump will put the tariffs on, and that will come on December 15th, or maybe before if President Trump decides to delay the imposition of tariffs. Now, on the Korean side, I think the most interesting report that's coming up is the employment report as well as the Green uh, Green Book report. The employment report for October was better than expected, but we still lost manufacturing jobs. We still lost jobs for 40 to 49-year-olds. So we need to see whether that trend continues, because that is basically the backbone of the Korean economy. Uh, There was a better than uh, expected job growth in October, but those are reportedly mostly government finance jobs. So we'll need to see whether any non-government finance jobs have increased. And then there's also on the Korean side, we have export-import prices, uh, price index coming, and that will hopefully give us a hint on whether semiconductor prices will rise. And then on the foreign side, we have OECD composite leading indicators. Uh, On Korean side, the uh, Korean leading indicators have been on a downward trend for 28 months, which is extraordinarily long. So uh, 
we'll have to see whether Korea breaks that trend. Uh, I tend to think not, but there's a good possibility it will because, well, the domestic sentiment in this indices have risen. And then on the U.S. side is the ISM Manufacturing Purchasers Index. That's interesting because Korea, uh, U.S. manufacturing reportedly is at the same level as it would be in a recession. So we'll need to see whether uh, U.S. manufacturing will still be in a very low level. Uh, if they are, then the possibility of U.S. recession is still there. And we'll be watching all of those figures, Dr. Yang, but we'll have to leave it there for today. Thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Now, South Korea is expected to see its workforce shrink faster than any other country in the world over the next two decades. Kim Dami has the details. Korea's working age population will continue to decline in the coming years. That's according to the World Trade Organization, who said on Monday that South Korea's working population will plunge by a whopping 17 percent by 2040. This is a faster drop than any other country in the world and is exactly the opposite trend of the global average, which is forecast to increase 17 percent during the same period. South Korea had 37 million people of working age defined as those aged 15 to 64 last year. Over the next 20 years, that number will fall to about 25 million. The report blames a demographic transition, namely the country's low birth rate and rapidly aging population. Experts point to raising labor productivity as one solution. You can raise labor productivity by increasing investment or increasing productivity of the workers, uh, either through having people produce more per hour or producing higher valued goods per hour. If you can't raise productivity, then you would have to uh, have more workers, uh, probably through immigration. In fact, the country's National Assembly Research Service has pointed out that such a dramatic drop in labor population may cause a lack of overall labor productivity and eventually threaten the country's economic growth rates. South Korea's GDP is only expected to grow by 65 percent by 2040, which also falls behind the global average of 80 percent. Kim Dami, Arirang News. In the global market for eco-friendly vehicles, sales of electric, plug-in hybrids and fuel cell vehicles are rising rapidly. But hybrid cars, which have so far dominated, seem to be losing ground. Hyundai Kia Automotive Group says that because of an increase in sales of its EVs, PHEVs and FCEVs from January to October this year, sales of hybrids accounted for less than 60 percent of its sales for the first time since the auto giant started selling them in 2009. For the others, EVs accounted for over 27 percent, PHEVs around 12 percent, and FCEVs slightly over 1 percent for a combined total of 40 percent. Among the three, EVs saw an especially big gain, with small electric SUVs also becoming more popular overseas. Winter is in full swing here in South Korea, so drivers are advised to get their cars ready for the cold weather because it can cause problems with the vehicle's engines, tires and brakes. Park Se-young has more. Drivers heading out on winter roads should get their vehicles ready for harsh weather conditions. One of the most important things to keep in check is the car battery. When the temperature falls, battery power decreases as it takes more power to start a car in the winter. To avoid being stranded in a snowstorm, drivers should change their battery every three to four years and keep it fully charged so that it's less likely to freeze. It also helps to park your vehicle in a garage if possible. Tires are also sensitive to the weather. When the temperature is low, the elasticity of rubber decreases and it contracts, causing air pressure to fall more quickly. Tire pressure should be kept at around 90 percent during the winter. If not, cars can have difficulty braking on slippery roads, which can lead to accidents. And people living in places with harsh winters should install winter tires, which provide better traction in ice and snow. If a vehicle is left out in the cold, the coolant can freeze. In the winter, a 50-50 antifreeze-to-water ratio keeps the coolant from freezing. Because groundwater contains many dissolved constituents, it's important to use tap water or distilled water. Antifreeze should be replaced every two years or 40,000 kilometers. And to be prepared for heavy snowfall, drivers should carry snow chains and familiarize themselves with how to put them on. Park Se-young, Arirang News.
And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.2016년 9월 28일 부정 청탁 및 금품 등 수수의 금지에 관한 법률 청탁금지법이 시행됩니다. 청탁금지법은 공직자 등의 공정한 직무 수행을 보장하고 공공기관에 대한 국민의 신뢰를 확보한 것을 목적으로 제정되었습니다. 청탁금지법으로 국민은 동등하게 대우받고 기업은 공정하게 경쟁하며 공직자 등은 청탁으로부터 보호받을 수 있습니다. 부정 청탁과 금품 수수가 없는 사회를 만들기 위해서 우리 모두의 공감과 노력이 필요한 시점입니다. 청탁금지법을 통해 우리 사회가 보다 공정하고 투명해집니다. 대한민국의 경쟁력이 강해집니다. 우리 아이들에게 더욱 자랑스러운 대한민국이 만들어집니다.